Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, a very short introduction by Martin Bunton. Now, uh, before I get started on the review, just a few words about the very short introduction series. It's a wonderful series put out by Oxford. There's probably hundreds of titles in it by now. You can see them all listed here on, on every subject that you might be interested in. Not every subject, maybe, but a lot of different subjects you might be interested in. And whenever I finish one of these, I usually will flip through and I'll order my next one. And I have to be careful not to do it too quickly, otherwise I'll just spend all my time reading very short introductions onto different subjects. Um, so for those of you who've stumbled onto my channel recently, you might wonder, okay, all, what are all these videos about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and where would I get started? Because you can see that I'm covering books from different aspects of the conflict, whether it's the Palestinian side or it's history, etc. So this book actually would be a nice place to start. You can see it's not very long. I think weighing it at 120 some pages, like most of these books, right? They are meant to be basic introductions. And I would argue I've only read five or six of them, but they tend to be fairly balanced given the subject matter that they're usually dealing with, which is by no means free from, from partisan, partisan strife. Uh, as for who could read this? I think that if you don't know anything, this would be an excellent place to start. If you do know a little, <laughs> Uh, I would classify myself as someone who knows a little. I still think it's a great addition because you're going to find out things that you didn't know. That That's always what, what goes on when you read about this conflict. But it also, because it starts from Zionism in the 1880s and it ends with the the last time that there was a, you could say, a peace process, uh, it, it gives us a really kaleidoscopic view. So I would say, yeah, it ends in... 2012-2014. So it's a good um, primer for those who, or it could be for a gift for a friend. So someone who you know has been interested in this topic, they're intimidated, they're looking at 300-page books, 400-page books that they're not quite sure they want to do it. Okay, they can do a 110, 120-page book. So some of the quotes that I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to focus on some of the early era just because I think it's something that's not as well known. And I'll, I'll read some of these quotes. A land without people for a people without land rang one prominent slogan that lies at the heart of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Had Palestine in fact been empty, there would be no conflict as we know it. Some Jewish leaders did recognize this. Ahad Ham, for example, visited Palestine and observed that it is difficult to find fields that are not sowed. He warned prophetically, if a time comes when our people in Palestine develop so that in small or great measure, they push out the native inhabitants, these will not give up their place easily. You don't say. <laughs> um, by 1914, approximately 85,000 Jews resided in Palestine, of whom about 35,000 had arrived in recent decades. So if you do the math, we're talking about 40,000 Jews prior to 1914, best numbers, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of Arabs by comparison, many of them Palestinians. In order to establish, this is a quote from Menachem Us Usishkin, who is president of the Jewish National Fund. In order to establish autonomous Jewish community life, or to be more precise, a Jewish state in Eretz Israel, remember we're talking about Eretz Israel, the, Jewish, the Jews are referring to the entire, what we see these days as the state of Israel and the occupied territories. It is necessary, first of all, that all, or at least most of Eretz Israel's hand, lands will be the property of the Jewish people. Without ownership of the land, Eretz Israel will never become Jewish, be the number of Jews, whatever it may be in the towns and even in the villages, and Jews will remain in the very same abnormal situation which characterizes them in the diaspora. This fact was really interesting to me, and it, it has to do with, it. it's right next to a map which was talking about the geography of where the early Zionist settlers would live, and they lived in the towns and in the cities. They were not working the land, and they were not interested in what is known as biblical Israel, where the Jews had built a history, where their kings lived and ruled, and this was a big shocker. 
Um, well, I'll just read the, the full quote. Most notably, the areas of biblical significance known as Judea and Samaria, located more prominently in Palestine's mountainous areas, were shunned for the coastal plains and valleys. Part of the reason for this may have been a lack of religious interest. For example, David Ben-Gurion, a leader of the second Aliyah, so an Aliyah is a, a wave of migration, wave of Jewish migration, centered labor Zionism's political and economic activities in Tel Aviv. He evidently did not visit Jerusalem until three years after his arrival. I want that to sink in. This is one of the political fathers of the state of Israel, maybe the political father of the state of Israel. The airport in Tel Aviv is named after this man, and he did not visit Jerusalem until three years after his arrival. We have to be clear that secular Zionism exists as a concept and harnesses the religious m messages of Judaism as it wishes to, I think fairly cynically. But the fact that David Ben-Gurion didn't go to Jerusalem for three years, you could ask, how Jewish are you? If a Jew doesn't go to Jerusalem, doesn't consider it one of the most important parts of his religious life, is that really Judaism or is that Zionism? And I think that's where we're seeing today in the media a wish to rewrite terms. So people are saying anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, which of course is total garbage. There is Zionism. Zionism is a brand new thing from the 1880s till now. It is a branch movement of Judaism which not even all Jews accept. There are plenty of anti-Zionist Jews. Judaism is thousands of years old, and that's a different conversation. But the idea that you can't be anti-Zionist is just one more way to refuse to acknowledge that Israel could ever make wrong moves, ever. And that's a problem, as we know. So going to the time of the British Mandate... By the time the war ended, Britain had put her signature on a confusing array of promises and declarations. She had pledged the future disposition of Palestine to no less than three different real or imagined allies. First, Britain's High Commissioner in Egypt, Sir Henry McMahon, made promises to Sheriff Hussein, the Hashemite ruler of the Hejaz region of Arabia, about the creation of an independent Arab kingdom. Secondly, Britain officially recognized the long-standing claims of her French allies to Syria, while staking claims of her own. Third, promises were made to Zionist leaders in London. A fourth set of commitments, spurred by U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, was broadcast about the rights of all peoples to independence and self-determination. Which, by the way, is something that the Palestinian leadership always sought to point out. It said, we are totally in with this Woodrow Wilson self-determination thing, and the British ignored this. The end result was a complex tangle of pledges and counter-pledges. British diplomats would do their best in the post-war years to square the contradictions, but these wartime agreements have remained to this day the source of much controversy and resentment. As I said earlier, you don't say. <laughs> um, this is a letter from the Foreign Office to November 1917 from James Balfour to Lord Rothschild. I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. Need I point out Jewish Zionist aspirations? Why the need to create a separation if it's just the same thing? If Zionism and Judaism is the same thing, if being anti-Zionist is being anti-Semitic, why would there be two differences here? They're saying it's Jewish Zionist aspirations. You can have Jewish aspirations, you can have Zionist aspirations, but Jewish Zionist aspirations. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. You know, is this, I mean, LOL? I, I'm not entirely certain how to treat this document, especially because it's coming from Arthur Balfour, which we will have a conversation about when I review a book on the Balfour Declaration later this year. But it's, 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 it's clear here the British say one thing and do another. They say, okay, yes, we'll, nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. And then they refuse to extend civil and religious rights to that same community. 
and to honor them as even being named. Let us remember that in the British Mandate of Palestine, the word Palestinian does not occur once. There are many items, I think there's nine items about antiquities, but not a word. They're just called non-Jewish natives. Let's keep going here. A tricky balancing act throughout the region, the mandate system was especially problematic in Palestine, the mandate for which incorporated the entire text of the Balfour Declaration, thus placing the small Jewish minority, composing about 10% of the population, in a uniquely privileged position. The mandate also inc included several articles specifying the obligation of Britain as mandatory power to support the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Remember again, those words were chosen precisely. Jewish national home does not mean state. It, it could mean state, but they chose it. They didn't use the word state in there because they wanted to keep things ambiguous. For example, facilitating Jewish immigration and encouraging Jewish settlement on the land. Meanwhile, as was the case with the Balfour Declaration itself, not once was the Palestinian Arab population mentioned by name. Because if you mention them, that might mean that they have rights. Once the Balfour Declaration was written into the terms of the mandate that sanctioned British rule in Palestine, one of several competing wartime promises was turned into a binding contract mediated by the League of Nations. As the British, British administration in Palestine came to feel the pressure of being caught in the escalating conflict between the mutually exclusive nationalist demands of the Jewish and Arab communities, many officials wanted to reconsider the promise of imposing a Jewish national home on an Arab majority. However, Britain also felt the constraints imposed by the internationally monitored mandate document and found it highly problematic to rescind the promise. So, this is the Peel Commission report from July of 1937. As things continue to get worse, they just commission commissions to come, they investigate, they find out things are bad, they report that things are bad, things are taken into consideration, nothing is really done. So this is a long quote from the commission report. It's not the commission report in full, obviously. The mandate cannot be fully and honorably Im implemented unless by some means or other the national antagonism between Arab and Jew can be composed. This is 1937. But it is the mandate that created that antagonism and keeps it alive. This is a British government document. And as long as the mandate exists, we cannot honestly hold out the expectation that either Arabs or Jews will be able to set aside their national hopes or fears and sink their differences in the common service of Palestine. That being so, real self-governing institutions cannot be developed, nor can the mandate ever terminate, without violation, violating its obligations, general or specific. For at any given time, there must be either an Arab or a Jewish majority in Palestine, and the government of an independent Palestine, freed from the mandate, would have to be either an Arab or a Jewish government. In the latter event, assuming repeat, we repeat that the miracle of reconciliation has not happened and that politics are still conducted on lines of race, the general obligation implicit in all mandates that the people entrusted to mandatory administration are to be enabled in course of time to stand by themselves would not have been fulfilled. Why? Because the Jews would be a minority in the situation. In the other event, the obligation in Article 2 for placing the country under such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home would not have been discharged. Manifestly, the problem cannot be solved by giving either the Arabs or the Jews all they want. The answer to the question, which of them in the end will govern, govern Palestine, must surely be neither. We do not think that any fair-minded statesman would suppose now that the hope of harmony between the races has proved untenable, that Britain ought either to hand over to Arab rule 400,000 Jews, whose entry into Palestine has been, for the most part, facilitated by the British government and approved by the League of Nations, or that if the Jews should become a majority, a million or so of Arabs should be handed over to their rule. But while neither race can justly rule all Palestine, we see no reason why, if it were practicable, each race should not rule part of it. So there are a couple points raw. I don't want to go too deep into it because I think it would take a long time, but he points out that the situation was created by the British. And so since we brought all these Jews here, the only fair thing would be to give them some of this land. However, that's manifestly 
unfair, given the circumstances, given that the mandate never recognized the Palestinians as their own people, nor gave them the opportunity to develop their own institutions, while the, while the Jews were, even though they were, they were a minority. This is an UNSCOP report to the General Assembly in 1947. This is before the proposal, the partition uh, line, which once again, the, even the partition proposal was crazy. And we can talk about that in another review. The central inland area of Palestine includes a large Arab population and leaving Jerusalem out of account, practically no Jews. This obviously is the main starting point in demarcating a possible Arab state. Further north, particularly in western Galilee, and separated from the central area by a narrow belt of Jewish settlements, is another concentration of Arabs and very few Jews. These two areas form the main territory of an Arab state, which is only a very small minority of Jews. The Jewish state, on the other hand, has its center and starting point in the coastal plain between Haifa and Tel Aviv, and even in this area there is also a considerable number of Arabs. Extensions of this area in the most suitable directions to include a larger number of Jews, as well as a larger land area, increase the proportion of Arabs to Jews in the Jewish state. So here's a fundamental problem that is being dealt with here, which is this idea of ethnic cleansing in relation to creating a state. Whereas people had lived in this land for centuries of different religions, Christian, Jew, Muslim, doesn't necessarily mean they were in the best conditions or they never fought or they never killed each other. But the sort of murder and killing that goes on today was never seen in all of those centuries. Uh, certainly not seen on, on a continuing scale and in, in, in the way that it is today. The idea is we can't create uh, an Arab state where there would be Jews and we can't create a Jewish state where there could be Arabs. Why not? Once again, this idea is a state must be racially pure in order to exist, but this is clearly not the case. It may be the case because of the religion, you know, the rising pseudo religion of nationalism, which is new, right? Remember that for most of human history, we have been peoples. We have not been nation states and nation states and people's religious attachment to nation states causes all sorts of problems. But here we can see this UNSCOP report, keep in mind, this is the UN now, not the League of Nations, envisions that the only way this can be resolved is if we create large Arab areas with very few or no Jews, or large Jewish areas with even some, they said this is problematic that there be any Arabs there, but how are you going to do that? You, you, and that's what we have now, where we have all these squiggly lines where we try to create areas that are purely Jewish and purely Arab, and this assumes those lines are never going to change. It's just a crazy idea. And once again here, uh, and this is the last quote I'm going to read for today, we've seen the breakthrough that the new historians, the new Israeli historians have had in their research into the Israeli state archives, which show what happened at the Nakba. The denial can no longer be made such that this is a very mainstream book, or, you know, published by Oxford University Press, hardly a conspiracy theory uh, publication, and listen to the text. And keep in mind, this text, as I'm about to read it, is denied by large segments of Israeli society to this day. I've run into Israelis who have denied it to my face. Reeling from the losses suffered during the 1937 to 1939 revolt and still paralyzed by political factionalism, Palestinian Arabs lack the necessary political and military structures with which to confront the well-coordinated forces of the Yishuv. Yishuv is just a name for the Jewish settlers as a community. When intercommunal clashes broke out in the winter of 1947 to 1948, many Arabs, especially the wealthy and middle-class families, fled the fighting with plans to return once the situation was safe again. Then, in April 1948, Haganah authorized a campaign known as Plan B, which gave Haganah officers authority to undertake the destruction and expulsion or occupation of Arab villages as deemed necessary to secure the interior of the emergent Jewish state. Keep in mind, Israel was not a state. These were terrorists. These were Jewish terrorists that led, that undertook the destruction and expulsion or occupation of Arab villages. In effect, the atrocities that occurred during the implementation of Plan D intensified the fears of the Arab population and led to the irreversible momentum of panicked flights, panicked flight from successive villages and towns. 
Among the most notorious attacks was the killing in April 1948 of over 100 Palestinian residents in the village of Dar Yassin by ear gun and stern gun, stern gang extremists, which, by the way, the majority of those were women and children, non-combatants. So um, there is a lot here that's worth digging into. And as I say, you'll, you'll read through it before you've even realized it, and you'll have a good framework for understanding Zionism's rise and where we are today with, with the peace process, if we can even call it that. I think it's effectively stalled and everybody knows that. If you would like to buy this book, there'll be a link to it uh, in the description below. Obviously, that will help support the channel. Also, would you'd also support the channel by hitting like, subscribe, sharing this with someone who you know is curious about this and open-minded and would like to learn more. This book will, I think, give them a, a good introduction. As I say, it's a very short introduction. It's a good introduction. You can leave a super thanks if you'd like to support the channel even more. If you want to support the channel beyond that, you could become a member of my Patreon or a member of the YouTube community. Those are monthly payments and it'll give you access to videos like this before they come out to the general public, as well as the ability to nominate videos, uh, books for me to do in a, in a video. There's also my Amazon wish list, which is linked if you'd like to search through, find a book that you connect with and want me to review, I might be able to do that. A reminder that all of the books that I'm reviewing in 2024 um, will, that lead to a review will be part of donations to the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. And that is a fund that helps children in Palestine get access to medical care that they could not otherwise get locally. As always, enjoy your reading.